I invite you to open a Bible to Psalm 23 as we continue studying this beloved psalm. It's a reminder to us of who our Jesus is. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they give all kinds of answers, that he's a prophet, that he's a teacher. And then he asks the disciples the questions. That he personalizes it. He asks them, who do you say that I am? Right, and that's the question that we all have to answer for ourselves of who do I believe Jesus is? Who do I say that he is to the rest of the world? And Psalm 23 gives you and me a wonderful answer to that question that he is our good shepherd and all the ways that he loves us and cares for us in this life and how he is the one who gives us God's mercy and grace. And most of all, he gives us eternal life from conquering sin, death, and the devil on our behalf. And so as we turn to Psalm 23 this morning, we're looking at the phrase that he leads us and he is with us through the valley of the shadow of death. And as you open a Bible to Psalm 23, I want to point out two things that are very basic realities of life. You're already going to know these things. All right, so it's a very easy quiz. Life is an amazing gift. There, there are all kinds of wonderful things to rejoice about and celebrate in this life. And I see no one nodding their head along with me. Right? Like, that's because there's another truth about life. A lot of times in life there is pain and sorrow and grief. And that one, a lot of times, feels a little more relatable, right? Where I can shout it all I want for the rest of the sermon, that, that life is this amazing gift from God, that there's all kinds of wonderful things to give thanks to him for, to celebrate and praise him for. Paul, throughout the New Testament, says to always be giving thanks to God. How many of you are always doing that, right? Because the other truth of life in this sinful world is that there, there's heartache, there's brokenness, there's sin, there's pain, there's sorrow, there's, there's things where it just doesn't always work out the way it is intended to or that we hoped it would or that we wished and prayed for it to happen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which is very commonly read at weddings, says it this way in verse 4, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, right? There, that's a reality of life. Sometimes there's times we are getting together to cry to weep, to mourn together, to comfort one another. And there's other times where we're getting together to laugh and celebrate. Ecclesiastes 3 goes on to say, there's also a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now we're Lutherans, so the time to dance is like not very often, but it's there, right? And the whole point is that there's these times in life because of sin and brokenness and things like that, that, that our hearts are heavy. There's times to grieve and there's times to mourn and cry. And there's also times in life where we're meant to celebrate and laugh and rejoice and give thanks to God for all the wonderful things in this world. This past weekend, I went to Milwaukee for the third time this summer. I am so tired of that drive. It was wonderful trips. I love everybody that I saw. I just don't want to do that drive anymore. All right, and it was great. We went for a wedding of a former member, and it was a wonderful, beautiful celebration. And there was indeed some crazy dancing that I have on some of our members on video on my phone to blackmail them anytime I so desire. You just, you just gotta let me know when you want to see the footage, okay? And I was dancing too. It was not pretty, but I was out there. All right. <laughs> And there's this wonderful time to celebrate and rejoice. And as the Bible says, yes, even a bunch of Lutherans get together and dance. And it's wonderful. And then I came back, which I was asked because I've been to Milwaukee so many times this summer. My brother's a pastor at a church. And someone actually asked me, are you staying there? Are you coming back? And I was like, no, I'm coming back. We'll see how you feel about that. But we came back. All right. And this week... In the same week of all the celebrating of the wedding and the rejoicing and the dancing, I had to do hospital visits for members who are scared and have undiagnosed conditions. There's all kinds of fear in life. 
And the reality is you and I both know, no matter how old we are or what our life experiences are, that Ecclesiastes is absolutely true. That in life there are these moments where we want to celebrate and laugh and rejoice and dance. And then there's other times where our hearts are aching. And we know there's times where we want to cry and mourn and grieve. Later on in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says this, that God has put eternity into our hearts. And that's a reason why our hearts ache sometimes when we are grieving and mourning because we know that, that we and everybody else and all of creation was created by God in goodness and in perfection meant for eternity, meant for eternal life, that all the sin and the brokenness and all the death and sorrow and grief of life is not meant to be, right? We, we are all aware of this to our very core because God has put it into our hearts and that's why sometimes Ecclesiastes says we're going to cry. We're going to grieve, we're going to mourn because we look at the world and it's very easy to go. This is not the way it should be. Anybody felt that way lately? Like in the last week or two, just looked at something and said, it's not the way it should be in the world or maybe just in your world. And part of that is because our hearts are aching for the eternal life that God has put in there. That, that, that we know, no, we're, we're meant for joy and life with him. And in Psalm 23, there's this wonderful line. It says in verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And it's a wonderful statement. There's this re of both things happening at the same time. Right? Anybody ever done Ecclesiastes all in the same day or week where there's rejoicing and thanksgiving and then later that day there's grief and sorrow? Right? And that's what Psalm 23 verse 4 is saying is that here's the reality of life. I'm not going to fear any evil. And the answer to why that is is because it says, for you are with me, right? Your, your rod and your staff are covered, saying, the good shepherd is with me. He is guiding me. He is protecting me. But the problem of life is what? Where are you walking? The sh valley of the shadow of death, right? Like, it's this weird dichotomy of life that, man, I got. I got the good shepherd, right? He's amazing. He's wonderful. He is with me. He is comforting me. He is protecting me. And at the same time, I feel like I'm walking through a valley. Right? And th this is what life looks like. And, and the reality is that this is the struggle that a lot of people have when it comes to trusting in Jesus and trusting in God. One of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible is a man runs up to Jesus asking for a miracle. And Jesus' response is, if I can. <laughs> and a guy says, oh, I believe, but help my unbelief, right? Isn't that what life is like sometimes? You're, you're walking through the valley of shadow of death. How many of you have heard Psalm 23 a whole lot of times in your life? How many of you have heard verse 4? I'm walking through the valley. How many of you have ever felt like you were stuck in that valley? You're like, here we are again. And you're like, I'm looking for a mountain to climb. And it just feels like, right? And at the same time, you're like, yeah. And someone goes, well, you don't have to be afraid because the shepherd's with you. Right? And sometimes what our heart says, what our soul says is that prayer of the centurion, which is, well, I believe it, Right? I believe in the good shepherd. I believe he's with me. I believe he's comforting. But man, this is a really big valley. <laughs> Anybody ever wonder when you get out of the valley? Like you've just been kind of there for a while. You're like, surely at some point we're going to like go back up. Right, Lord? And that's what life feels like. So the question becomes, well, where's Jesus in it? Like, what does Jesus do for you and me and for all people? What does he offer us when we're stuck in the valley? In John chapter 11, there's this wonderful story of Jesus and Lazarus. 
But before you get to the amazing miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus, you, you have a part of the story where everybody's walking through the valley. Right? It even says that, that Lazarus has been dead for four days, which means he's dead. Even though Jesus said, oh, he's asleep, it's four days, which means people have been grieving for a while. They've kind of begun to accept it, that, that he is gone. And then Jesus shows up, and you think, because you and I know the story, we're like, oh, this is going to be great. Lazarus is going to be Right? I've done a lot of funerals as a pastor. And it would be a wonderful thing to witness in the middle of the sermon, Jesus saying, get up. And Jesus shows them, we, we know that the, that's the end of the story, but before you get there, you have this interaction with Jesus and Mary and Martha, and they're grieving the loss of their brother, and Jesus himself weeps because he loves Lazarus. And here is what happens when he gets there. Martha, in verse 21 of John 11, said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here. And it's one of my favorite statements in the whole Bible. Now, I know it's not what you're supposed to say, right? Anybody ever done that? Like on the inside, you had all kinds of feelings and things that you wanted to say, whether to another person or to God himself. But the words that came out of your mouth were totally different because you knew probably don't say that in church, right? <laughs> don't say that in a prayer, right? And what I love about Martha, like everybody stays behind. Mary, everybody is grieving together, right? And Martha marches out of the house, away from everybody else, runs down the street, right? And I love that it says, oh, it's a couple miles away. So we don't know how close Jesus is, is yet. But she's like, someone told her he's on his way. And she doesn't wait. She runs to meet him. And the first thing she says to Jesus, I just want to, no, okay. <laughs> Think for a moment for yourself. When you're in the valley, when you're upset at life, when you're hurting your grief, whatever the circumstance, whether it's a death of a loved one, or it's an illness, it's a strained relationship, it's lost, whatever it might be, that's not going your way. And you have an opportunity to talk to Jesus about it in person. I just want you to think about for a moment, what would I say to him? Now, I know, as I've thought about it, here's the right thing that you want your pastor to say from the pulpit. <laughs> Lord, I trust you no matter what. Lord, I know you have a wonderful plan for me because Romans 8 says so. And Jeremiah 29 says so also, right? Lord, like whatever you will, Lord, I'm okay, right? Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done, right? How many of you are like, that's the right stuff to say? Show a hand. How many of you, and you better be honest with me, because I talk to God about you, all right? on the inside are not saying that as the first thing out of your mouth when you run to Jesus about it. Any? Yeah, look at all of us being honest, right? I know in my circumstances, when I've been in the valley, it's like, I'm running to Jesus, and it's because I got some thoughts to share with him that are not always pulpit appropriate. And that's what I love about Martha. It's been four days. Now, he, we all know that sometimes life moves slowly, right? You ever felt an hour last forever, right? I really doubt if you asked Martha, how many days has it been? She would say, oh, it's been four. She probably knew, but I doubt she would say, it feels like four. It's been a short, right? For her, Mary probably felt like it's been our whole life. It's this exhausting kind of thing when you're in the valley of the shadow of death, when you're hurting, when, when life is not going the way you want it to be. And so she runs out to meet Jesus, and the first thing she says to him is, if you had been here. Now, why I love that statement so much is because of its honesty, because there's a lot of times we all want to say to Jesus, 
I believe you're the good shepherd. I believe you comfort me. I believe that you give eternal life. I believe you can do anything, right? So we go to him in prayer. And then when it's been four days of being stuck in the valley, you kind of go, well, I need you to help my unbelief, Lord. I need to understand your plan here. I need to understand your ideas here. I need to understand what's going on. And so we want to cry out, like, if you had been here. And how many times have all of us, when our hearts are aching about different circumstances of life, wanted to shout at God, like Martha, man, if you had been here, you could have changed what happened. You could have miraculously shifted the circumstances. You could have healed the relationship. You could have brought reconciliation and forgiveness. You could have given me a new job. You could have, and then you got to fill in the blank, right? But there's this other side of this statement. It's not just anger for Martha. It's not just frustration of like, man, we've been in this valley for a little while now. And I know, Lord, if you had been here, it wouldn't have happened. But it's also a statement of faith, right? Because she's saying, if you had been here, what does that mean? It means that what she believes about Jesus is that he is able to save Lazarus, to do the miracle, to heal him, to give him life, to conquer death. So there is this dichotomy of faith in this broken world where we find ourselves in the valley of shadow, which is Lord, I believe in you, and I know you can do it. And then sometimes there's the heartache of life, which is, if you had been here. And this is their interaction. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Right? You can see Martha's hope is kind of extending of like, okay, well, that one didn't happen. But Lord, I know you're still capable of miracles. I know you're still capable of, of guiding me and drawing me out of the valley. And then Jesus goes on to say to her, your brother will rise again. And I love that statement because how frustrating is that to hear in the moment of those griefs, right? Oh, they're in heaven. They're in a better place. They're with Jesus. And all those things are wonderful and true. And I've never met a person at a funeral who was like, Amen. Like, woo! Because we're like, yeah, but, you know, if you've been, like... And that's Martha's frustration. She's like, I know. <laughs> now, I know there's not tone written into the text, but how many of you would have tone with your statement there if you were Martha, right? Like, look, I know. I know, Lord, that he's going to rise again. I, like, I, I know it's true. But I'm still in the valley. That's the that's the hurt, right? It's like I know it's true, but I'm still stuck here. And then Jesus said to her, "I am the resurrection and the life." Now, this isn't Jesus just making a fancy statement. This isn't Jesus just saying something that like Martha already knew is true and believed it. It's not something that. Wow, it's just there to, to sound great. It's Jesus bringing the reality of his presence to the valley. Martha is saying, like, yeah, I know <laughs> that eventually Lazarus is going to rise from the dead, and that's wonderful, Lord. But right now, here in this reality, guess what? It hurts. I'm stuck. I'm in the valley. And what Jesus does when he says, I am the resurrection life, he's bringing that reality to the valley. He, he's saying to Martha, no, no, no. I'm right here. All the comfort, all the hope that you need is right here with you in this moment of grief and sorrow and pain, in this moment of you feeling stuck in the valley. He's not saying, yeah, it's like down the road. <laughs> and if you just keep trudging along, you'll eventually get there. When Jesus pauses and says to her, 
I am the resurrection of life. He's like, no, no, I'm here right now in the valley with you. It's not a hope that's for down the road. It's not this comfort that's, well, maybe it'll happen. It's Jesus saying, this is who I am. I am the God of hope. I'm the good shepherd in the valley with you. And this is what Psalm 23 tells us. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? There's this acknowledgement that like, here we are, right? You're like Martha, here we are, Lord. <laughs> I'm trusting in you. I'm holding on. But this is a really deep, dark valley, right? Anybody ever felt really low in life, like stuff is going on and just piling up, and you're like, it couldn't get possibly deeper and darker and worse than this. And then you regretted saying that because like the next week you're like, wow, this valley just keeps going, right? So even though we're walking through it, I will fear no evil, right? And it's like Martha saying, like, like, I know that God is with me. Jesus, I know that you could do anything. Like, I know it didn't happen back then, and we're going deeper into the valley. But even now, just like Martha said, even now, I, I still hold it out hope that you can do a miracle, Jesus. Yeah, but here's where all the hope comes from. It's the same hope that Jesus gave to Martha when he says, I'm the resurrection of life. He's saying, it's not down the road, Martha. All the hope, all the resurrection, all the life is right here, right now with you in the midst of the grief and the sorrow and the pain. And here's what verse four says in Psalm 23, for you are with me. So all the courage that David has when he said, I'm going through the valley, but I'm not gonna fear any of the evil of life. I'm not gonna feel, fear any of the things that are going wrong that, right? When he says evil, that's what he's saying. It's like all the stuff that you and I look at in life and go, yeah, it's not the way it should be. He said, I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by it. It's not because you're looking at King David and be like, well, he was awesome. The whole foundation for all of his courage and all of his hope when he's in the valley is when he says, for you are with me. And this is the goodness of Jesus as your good shepherd. Because here's the reality of life, right? Sometimes we're going to laugh and we're going to dance, and we're going to rejoice. And there's going to be other times where you're wondering, just how in God's name deep does this valley go? And the goodness of Jesus as our shepherd, the promise of John 11 to Martha, the promise of Psalm 23 to you and me is Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd who's with you. Not just when you're dancing and laughing and rejoicing, when you're in the valley. Now, here's the thing that I love about verse four is there's this word that we translate the shadow of death, right? And the Hebrew word is salmawet, and it means gloom or darkness. So you can translate this. You could say verse four is the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of gloom, the valley of the shadow of darkness, right? So sometimes it's not death in life that is making our hearts ache. Sometimes life just feels gloomy. Nothing's working out. You're like, it's been a while since I've had a time, like Ecclesiastes said, where I felt like laughing or dancing or rejoicing, right? Sometimes we're in the valley of the shadow of gloom. Sometimes we're in the valley of the shadow of darkness where it just feels like nothing's going right for us or people that we love. And it can be overwhelming. But the comfort of Psalm 23 is not that, well, here it is. And you know, if you just act tough and, and keep soldiering on, you'll eventually get out of the valley. The comfort of Psalm 23 is where it says, you, the shepherd, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says we don't have a high priest and it's speaking about Jesus that we're not able to connect with or relate with. It says that he's able to sympathize with us and all the things that we're going through. Because it's, Hebrews 4 says that, that Jesus has gone through all the ups and downs of life, all the temptations and hardships of life. And so he's able to understand what we're going through. The comfort for you and me is that when we're in that valley... And we feel stuck in it. How many of you, like, like, side note, 
It says, even though I walk, how many of you sometimes feel like you're not walking? You're just like there, right? You're just like, oh, we're supposed to walk through this? <laughs> I'm kind of just stuck, right? Like Mary and Martha, it's been four days. I'm not moving. Or it doesn't feel like you're moving, right? Here's the good news. It says, no, the, the shepherd is with me, which means Jesus, as Hebrews 4 says, he's able to sympathize. He, he's already walked through the valley for you. Yeah, that's, that's the hope. That we, and that's when he says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He's like, I've already, I've already walked through that valley of death on your behalf. I've already led the way, and which is why he's like, that's why I'm able to walk with you. And I'm able to comfort you, even though it's dark. Even though it's gloomy, even though it's not fun, even sometimes it feels like I'm not walking, <laughs> I'm just standing. And sometimes you probably feel like I'm just laying down, <laughs> right? Like I got no more energy. It's just here we are, Lord, you do something. And here's the beautiful thing about this word, the valley of the shadow of death, is Hebrew word salmawet, is it's used all over the Old Testament and it's used in the New Testament. There's this wonderful Christmas passage that you have heard. And I'm already thinking about Advent because for pastors, it's like, it's really close, okay? All right, I'm a little stressed out, but we're going to get there and celebrate. It's going to be fun. But there's this wonderful Advent Christmas passage that I know you know. Isaiah chapter 9 says this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt those who are stuck in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Now, I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with that passage. It gets read at Advent and Christmas all the time. It's this wonderful celebration that he, it's describing who our Savior is, that he is coming and he's arriving. What it's saying is all the people who are in the valley of the shadow of death, it's the same phrase. That's here in Psalm 23. All the people that are in the valley of the shadow of gloom, the, the valley of the shadow of darkness, who feel that you're walking through it and then you feel like you're dwelling in it, right? You're, you're just kind of stuck in it. And here's the wonderful hope of Jesus that you can celebrate before Advent is that the light has come for them. Right? That, that the light of the world, Jesus to his resurrection and life and hope and life, is not just saying it's down the road. You just keep going and trudging through the valley. Eventually you'll get there. No, it's saying it's here. Jesus is here in the valley with you. He is the light shining in the darkness. And there's one more uh, Christmas Advent passage I want to share with you. I love Christmas, so I'm gonna, I like sharing stuff. By the way, I cheat and I watch Christmas movies year round. I don't care. All right. John chapter one, verse five is speaking about Jesus. It's, the, it's John's version of the birth story, Christmas story. It says this, the light shines in the darkness. And here's the really beautiful hope. And the darkness has not overcome it. The reality of life, we're going to walk in the valley of the shadow of death and darkness and gloom. We're going to look at the world. We're going to look at our lives and say, it's not always going the way I hoped or planned or prayed for. But the good news of Jesus is that he's a good shepherd who is with you in the valley, comforting you. He is the light shining in the darkness and the really good hope for you and me the hope that is for today and tomorrow and for all eternity is that the darkness doesn't overcome jesus sometimes we feel overwhelmed and we feel defeated but we have a jesus standing right in front of us just like he did in martha's grief saying i'm the resurrection I am the life. I am the light of the world. I'm shining in the darkness of your valley. And he's making this promise saying, look, the darkness is not going to overcome me. I've overcome it for you. 
And that's the good news and the hope for you and me. Now, here's the reality. You and I are not the only ones who walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We're not the only ones walking through darkness. We're not the only ones stuck in gloom. It's a whole world filled with people going, this is broken. <laughs> this ain't right. There's a whole world of people walking around in darkness and going, where is the light? So what you and I are called to do as Christians is say, yeah, here's the reality of life. We don't sugarcoat it. We don't like trick people. We just tell them like, yeah, the valley sucks. <laughs> right? I know you're not supposed to say it from the pulpit, but like I've, I've counseled enough people to know that's the word you want to say when you're going through it. Just like, this is not pleasant. This is not fun. And so what we do is we tell the world the truth of God's world, word. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, man. Sometimes we're going to laugh or rejoice and dance. And other times you're going to be stuck in the valley. And it's going to be a time to mourn and grieve. This is why Paul says in the New Testament, we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And you and I are called to take the same comfort that we have from the good shepherd, the same light that is shining in our lives, and to share it with others that are lost in the darkness and say, there is comfort here. There is a shepherd who will wipe away your tears. There is light and life in the valley of the shadow of death and darkness. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the good shepherd who walks with us in the valley of the shadow of death and darkness. That you stand before us comforting us by saying you are the resurrection and the life. You are the light of the world who has conquered death and darkness and sin and the devil for us. May we be so comforted by that good news and hope that we share it with the rest of the world who is walking through the valley as well. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.